so um, in this talk, I'm going to uh, talk about uh, what the aesthetic appreciation of math might be involved in, because it's a common saying uh, that you hear from people who do math all the time, that mathematics is beautiful or elegant or graceful. or um, These kinds of words that are similarly utilized uh, when we discuss aesthetic features of uh, works of art or even uh, nature itself. Um, and so this is a, an intersection between uh, two areas that I've, I've found that of people who say things that, about how math is beautiful, they never really specify exactly what it is that they're talking about. Uh, so this is an investigation to try to um, uh, uncover what that could possibly mean. So I want to start off um, by talking just a little bit about what some possible candidates for this might be, um, just to give a sense of what people have actually said are uh, aesthetically pleasing uh, mathematical equations or, um, or, or similar kinds of entities. Um, but then I want to talk a little bit about the history of aesthetic theory in the West, um, just to give um, a little bit of background as to why I talk about this the way that I do. Um, and then we'll look at some deeper examples, and then hopefully we can um, come to the point where we can see my positive idea about how this all goes together. Right. So for example, these are some um, claims that uh, people have stated are beautiful, right, or marvelous. Um, a number of these uh, are probably familiar to you. This is, of course, just the representation of the Pythagorean theorem, um, the theorem about uh, the uh, uh, relationship between the sides and the hypotenuse of a right triangle. Uh, this is the claim that the uh, numeral 1 is equivalent to the infinitely repeating decimal point 9999999999. Um, and uh, this is uh, uh, another uh, equation that uh, links together five fundamental mathematical constants all in one tight little neat, um, neat package, right? So you've got uh, e, i, pi, one, and zero, all interrelated in a very nice cohesive way um, that, that demonstrates in a sense that they're uh, mutually dependent in some <coughs> sense. Um, so these are the, the kinds of things that people talk about, but as uh, uh, you guys might be familiar with or you might have experienced yourself that this does not look like the Mona Lisa Right? Or if you're uh, 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 averse to mathematics, then looking at these kinds of things just make you want to run and, and hide somewhere and maybe read Shakespeare or something like that. Um, <laughs> so the, um, the purpose of, of this then is to try to uncover what it is that's contained within these things uh, that excites people so much to be willing to say that they are, uh, they're, they're beautiful right? or they have aesthetic features. So first, let's just talk a little bit about the history of the word aesthetics in the West. So. Here's a quick and dirty history of modern aesthetics. Um, the word was first used in its modern context, or roughly its modern context, by a German philosopher by the name of Alexander Baumgarten, who, um, in his book Aesthetica, uh, published in 1750, uh, ad, or, or was developed a, a science uh, or a philosophy of sense perception, right? Uh, that uh, the connection between the word aesthetics and the Greek aesthesis is, uh, is clear. The, um, uh, the philosophy was meant to describe and to delineate the faculty of perception that we have. Now, later in that century, uh, the, one of the most important and significant, significant works in aesthetic was published in Germany uh, by Immanuel Kant. I didn't put the date up there. The Critique of the Power of Judgment is 1791. And in it, he uses the word aesthetics in a very particular sense. Um, when he talks about in his, uh, uh, his regular theoretical philosophy, uh, the word intuition is something that is used for sense perception. And when he talks about aesthetic appreciation and aesthetic experience, he's talking specifically about a kind of experience that we have. Um, now, we don't need to get into the details of what Kant's ultimate theory about this is, um, but it's important to look at just a very quick um, uh, description of his uh, about his aesthetic theory uh, that characterizes in a fundamental way that, uh, one direction in which thinking about this has gone. So he says uh, at the very beginning of Critique of the Power of Judgment uh, that the judgment of taste is, not, is therefore not a cognitive judgment, hence not a logical one, but is rather aesthetic by which is understood one whose determining ground cannot be other than subjective. Now, of course, Kant means something very specific by this, and so we have to be careful to not interpret what he says here with what we think these words mean. Um, basically, uh, what he's, uh, he's saying is that when we make cognitive judgments about things, uh, we connect a certain faculty of our understanding to a kind of sense experience. And our 
our cognition organizes this into a particular way where we can make a determinate judgment. Um, and all he means by determinate judgment is when I say that you know, this podium is black, right? This is the kind of determinate judgment that he's, um, he's talking about. Um, but uh, when the faculties of intuition, that is the sense perception, and our faculty of cognition, when they become in some sense unhinged from the objects of perception and they sort of move back and forth between each other um, in a kind of free interplay or free play, uh, this is the experience of something aesthetic. Right? So the important thing here is that it's not cognitive though. Uh, it doesn't have a cognitive content. It doesn't have a, a positive content. It's something that is, well, ineffable, right? And it, this seems, of course, to track uh, what it is when we experience something that's really beautiful. I mean, it's beyond words. It's something that we can't uh, characterize. It's something that we can't put into a little box and say, this is exactly what I experienced then. You know, you just had to be there, or it just, you know, it blew me away. So this is uh, all that uh, is really contained in what Kant is saying about uh, aesthetic judgment, um, again, that it's subjective, that it takes place within the context of our own faculties of conceiving and understanding the world, um, and also it's one that is lacking in any determinate content. Right? Now Kant does spend some time talking about the specific ways in which objects provide us with these kinds of experiences. And of course, these are very connected to 18th century discussions, not only about <coughs> beauty, um, but also that other uh, great 18th century concept, that of sublimity. Um, now, the, um, fortunately, there are no philosophers here, because if there were, um, as I start talking about this, they will uh, try to connect the stuff that I'm going to say about mathematics with Kant's conception of the sublime. Um, but fortunately, the two are so far from each other that there's really no relationship. So just pretend that um, you're philosophers and you've asked me that question and I've responded to you effectively. Now, what's interesting about this, um, uh, uh, Kant's particular uh, concept of uh, aesthetic um, beauty is that, uh, number one, it's uh, primarily formalist in account, which means that it's in virtue of certain kinds of forms that we perceive in things that uh, we have this experience of beauty. But also, the idea of fine art, uh, what we often normally ex associate with aesthetic ex experience, is not on Kant's radar at all. Um, it's very um, uh, tangential and secondary to the experience of beauty that he's focusing on. And for him, the prime experience of beauty comes in experiencing nature. Right? <coughs> so if we fast forward, not that long, um, we can look at the way in which aesthetic theory changed and developed in the 19th century. So art is an afterthought for Kant, uh, but in Hegel's aesthetic theory, uh, you know, Hegel is one of Kant's main intellectual uh, successors. Uh, natural beauty is tangential, and uh, fine art and theory of fine art itself is central for, uh, for Hegel. Right? So we see this, uh, this trend a lot in 19th century works of aesthetics, and this is true not only on the continent, but also in England as well. Um, if you imagine or think of uh, John Ruskin, for example, and his, um, uh, his focus on, well, the relationship between natural and artistic beauty and the ways in which um, works of art uh, embody natural beauty and uh, natural ideals and so on. Um, but that's a, a long history we don't need to get into. Uh, the point is, is that we've got this, um, this tension that emerges out of the tradition between the uh, prime location of aesthetic experience being something that we find in nature versus the prime location of aesthetic, aesthetic experience that we find in terms of manufactured art, right? things that human beings create, whether it's painting or sculpture, or architecture, or nature, you know, and so on. Right? But as I say, a conceit of much 19th century Western art uh, and theory is that these concepts are coextensive or mutually supportive of each other. Right? So um, then comes the 20th century, which messes everything up. So here is just an example, a quick example of art with cognitive content. Right? So in some sense, um, it doesn't seem to be possible for a theory like Kant's to be able to explain what it is that matters about this painting. Right. If you guys know this painting, this is pa Pablo Picasso's painting Guernica, uh, painted in 1937 um, after the, uh, the Nazis had utilized the uh, rural town of Guernica to test uh, some of their, uh, their new weaponry as a prelude to the, uh, the war that was escalating in Europe. So um, innocent uh, people were killed. Uh, There's a lot of death and destruction. Um, it was, a, again, a real historical event. But if we try to understand this painting merely in terms of the, 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 the formal elements of it, which are 
uh, amazing. I mean, if you like Picasso, that is, um, you miss what this painting is about. It seems difficult to get a real interpretation of this painting without recognizing that it's actually about something, right? And uh, there's definitely a moral message to this particular work of art that Picasso is, uh, is, uh, is advocating for us. Right? So it seems that a, a, a theory uh, about aesthetic beauty, at least in the context of fine art, uh, doesn't work when that sort of cognitive content is missing. Right? But then, what about aesthetics at all? So take, for example, this. Right? One of the great uh, conceits of uh, 20th century artists is that um, we can make non-aesthetic art. Right? Now, uh, depending on what we think aesthetic properties and non-aesthetic properties are, uh, we can debate over which piece actually does this and which one doesn't. Um, but when Marcel Duchamp uh, exhibited this uh, piece, Fountain, uh, in 1917, uh, he did so in the context of an art world that was devoted to some of the traditional aesthetic criteria, like you know, beauty and grace and seriousness of subject matter and so on. Uh, but as you can see here, if you don't know about this piece, um, Duchamp just went out to uh, something equivalent to the local hardware store and bought this. Uh, this is a urinal, right? It's, it's set upside down. Um, but it's a toilet, right? And of course, he signed it and dated it like all good artists do with their work, and he stuck it in an art museum. And henceforth, this has been known as one of the great works of art of the 20th century, right? But unless you really go in for ceramics, right, or ceramics that are urinal shaped, you're not going to say that this is, um, this is beautiful. Right? Or, you know, or this doesn't like elevate the spirit in the way that the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel does. Right? It's not about great you know, human themes, again, unless you think that urination um, is a great human theme. Right? So uh, the, there, there's this um, uh, division in the way that we think about aesthetics today in which a lot of these kinds of traditional properties of beauty and grace and elegance uh, are um, are, are not really uh, central to understanding a, um, a, a work of art. Instead, um, what is interesting about Duchamp's fountain is, um, well, to um, borrow uh, some terminology from uh, the, uh, the humanities, that uh, it's the, the way it constructs a certain sort of meta-narrative about our experience of art at all. Um, because confronting Duchamp for the first time, I mean, the joke is old now, right? My kid could have done this, right? But, uh, you know, back in, in, the, in the day, right, this would have forced us to uh, rethink our assumptions about what counts as a work of art and what doesn't. Um, and Duchamp's joke, if uh, we can take it as that, was, was just to say, look, all that I need to do to make a fancy work of art is just put it in a place where people are going to call it that, right? And, uh, this kind of lesson about what can or can't be a work of art seems to be the ultimate message of what Duchamp was getting at. And there are plenty of other uh, examples of this. Um, you know, Duchamp's ready-mades are, of course, um, um, an excellent one. Um, another of my favorites is Andy Warhol's Brillo Box, right, where Andy Warhol just took plywood and paint and reconstructed an exact replica of the kind of Brillo Box you would find in the supermarket. All right. So uh, the upshot of all this is, uh, that uh, we see that works of art seem to come with a, a significant cognitive content. Um, and it's not uh, just this experience where we kind of um, you know, shut off our faculties and uh, just let it wash over us. Now, this, this certainly can happen. Um, I mean, I think uh, maybe <coughs> music is probably the best example of this. Uh, but uh, there is a, a, a tradition in philosophy about this. Uh, called the uh, aesthetic attitude, that there's a proper way to experience things, which uh, requires us to just sort of turn off our minds and let the music or let whatever we're looking at sort of wash over us. And what I'm, just, uh, what I'm trying to suggest here is that um, there's not a disconnect between aesthetic experience and a kind of real cognitive experience. Now, of course, you can see why that would matter for a paper like mine, right? Uh, if the experience, uh, aesthetic experience of something like mathematics is going to be there, it's probably going to be in a way that addresses our, um, uh, the way that our minds work about this, or the way that our minds can lock on to some particular positive kind of claim. Right? Is that a hand up? OK. OK, so there's just um, by way of um, introduction, right? So now I can talk about the more positive aspect of the, this project. In, Figure out or trying to figure out just what the aesthetic features of mathematics are. Um, this right here is an image of the uh, the Mandelbrot set, which I'll talk about in a second. 
And when we first think about aesthetics of mathematics, this might be what we think about. Uh, you saw the, the other fractal picture I had at the beginning of this talk. And these things, they look nice. Right? Uh, there's symmetry to them. There's order to them. And you know, people have even gone so far as to put these things up on their walls as decoration. Right? They, they function even as art objects in our, our, our lives. But what I want to suggest is that what you see here is not the object of aesthetic appreciation, at least in terms of what this is mathematically. That instead, there's something else that's going on with uh, what's behind this that serves as the, uh, the object of aesthetic appreciation. Mm -hmm. So uh, you might ask yourself, how does this thing get made? Well, this is uh, how to construct the Mandelbrot set part one. right? Um, so the Mandelbrot set is in the complex plane. Uh, so it's like your xy plane, but instead of um, uh, to having two real coordinates, you have this other um, uh, coordinate that uh, has the imaginary part of it. So i is the imaginary number, square root of negative 1. Um, and all that, that happens here is uh, you start by choosing some particular complex number, and you iterate it through this function. Um, and if the, uh, the sequence is bounded, you color the picture black. If it's unbounded, you color it some other color. right? So in this, the, um, the black parts are all the values for this, uh, this function that are bounded. right? They don't escape toward infinity. And uh, the colors are the ones that do. Uh, the colors are different depending on the rate at which the, uh, the function escapes toward infinity. If, uh, if it goes very relatively slowly, it's co colored in these warmer colors. Um, if it goes quickly, it's in these, uh, these darker colors. Right. So the picture we have iterates for all the points in the complex plane. Um, and this is just what I uh, explained uh, before. But this is what's important. The picture is a snapshot with the result of an infinite set of points and an infinite process of iteration, right? Or at least um, the, the actual process of iterating is not infinite because there are ways in which we can do this that don't take us forever, which is why we can have a, uh, um, a, a nice picture of this. Um, but the, the point is, is that the, the work that's being done here is just a, a snapshot of a very deep and uh, multifaceted uh, idea, right? That uh, there's much more to it than the picture can represent. Right? So what I'm claiming here is that what's specifically mathematical about this is not what's in the picture. It's, it's in something else. And one way in which you can think about that is if you've ever played around with these, um, what's uh, sort of interesting about them is the kind of self-similarity that these uh, images exhibit. And so as you, as you zoom in closer, down into these, uh, these crevices, for instance, um, this pattern, as, it, as you see, it decreases slowly, um, keeps going all the way down. And as you zoom in closer and closer and closer, right, you can still see that um, uh, there are these structures that are there, which aren't visible to the naked eye. Uh, they're visible, say, when you zoom on, in on your computer graphic a little bit more. But the idea is, is that you could still keep doing this right, and still be able to see something that is well, aesthetically pleasing, as it were. Right. So just for example, um, I might be wrong about this. So if you math people can uh, um, uh, correct me on that, uh, that regard. Um, but if we plot the point negative 1, right, this is where negative 1 is on the, um, on the complex plane. And so you can imagine the, the traditional x-axis running straight through here. Um, and then the, the the y-axis for, for, the, for the complex plane sort of runs up this way. And the, the number i ends up being at the very end of that, that tiny little branch. And this right here, this image is taken from a, a different program that allows me to, to pick a point and zoom in really, really, really far. And so you can see that um, even here, there's not a, a very clear black spot, but um, there are a couple of them that are part of these, uh, these branches. So um, uh, that's just a, another representation of how uh, complex this kind of thing is. All right. So, how do aesthetics uh, and mathematics relate? Well, one of the, the key levers of the way that I think about this is that aesthetic appreciation depends on appreciating something in the correct category. That is, appreciating x depends on knowing what x is. And so, Think back to Marcel Duchamp's fountain. Now, if I just 
hauled a urinal into this room here and just stuck it in the corner, right? Uh, you would look at it and you'd see, well, you know, maybe somebody from facilities just came here and, and left it there. Then I come back and pick it up later. Um, you wouldn't sit there and you know marvel and admire at how significant it was that I had I had done something like this. I like brought a urinal that you wouldn't you wouldn't have known. Um, but with Duchamp, right, because of, of the context in in which the work is we are naturally inclined to um, attribute to it a, a, a different set of properties, right? Then uh, the urinal becomes clever. You know, Duchamp has a funny joke that he's told. Um, he's being sarcastic or, or whatever. Um, when it comes to thinking about uh, aesthetics, uh, and this is the connection that Rick had mentioned at the beginning of, uh, beginning of the, the talk, um, that there are uh, ways of depicting nature, for example, uh, that depend fundamentally on the way in which the artist is uh, thinking about nature in terms of what nature really is and uh, understanding what the artist is doing and appreciating what the artist is doing sort of depends on how they understand the reality behind it right uh, another it, Excellent example is Picasso's Guernica, right? Because uh, if you appreciate this as a painting that is done in black and white and, and grayscale, well, you've gone a, a certain way toward appreciating what Picasso has done. But when you understand that it's about this particular uh, incident between the with the Nazis, uh, then the the painting's uh, meaning takes on that much more significance. So we want to ask the question: What is mathematics about? And I'll be interested to hear what uh, my colleagues in math have to say about this. Um, there are a number of theories in philosophy uh, or philosophy of math that, that address this, and I want to focus on two of them. Um, the two theories of uh, mathematics I want to look at are, uh, I'm going to refer to as Platonism, and the other one is uh, intuitionism, uh, or sometimes called constructivism. Uh, these aren't the only two theories, but there are some other ones that don't work out so well for reasons that we don't need to get into. Um, and then there are others that I think, for my purposes, will move to either one or the other, that the discussion of Platonism and uh, constructivism will be sufficient to, um, uh, to, um, to, to make my case uh, uh, totally. All right. So the difference between Platonism and intuitionism is um, significant. Uh, Platonism, in general, tends to hold that there are abstract objects uh, that exist outside of the world of perception. And when we discuss a particular mathematical statement like you know, uh, you know, the Pythagorean theorem you know, for any right triangle, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, uh, the truth of that is, comes from attaching to or pointing toward this non-perceptible realm. Right? Um, or that when we use the number seven, for example, right, the number seven is pointing to uh, not seven particular things, uh, but rather to the abstract concept of seven, if you will. Right? Now, uh, if you go in for this kind of stuff, this is great, but um, uh, when you start talking about how this is supposed to work, it gets pretty wacky because you're talking about this, this realm that exists beyond space and time um, that, of course, nobody has ever seen, but we believe must be there. Um, and so this has motivated the uh, intuitionist line of thought, which incidentally, as a historical note, really comes out of um, uh, uh, Kantian philosophy, which is where it gets the name intuitionism. Um, but the best way to understand um, intuitionism, I think, is that the interpretation of truth in intuitionism is different than it is uh, normally. Normally, when we say something is true, uh, the general common sense way of thinking about this is that a statement is true just in case the world is the way that you say it. Right? So um, if I say that the, you know, the podium is black, that statement is true. If it happens to be the case that the podium I'm talking about is black. Uh, but intuitionists understand and truth in terms of provability. Um, so a classical interpretation of, say, negation, uh, to say that not A, right, this means that it is not the case that A, right? So I could say, it is not the case that my shirt is blue, right? But in intu intuitionism, they interpret this, uh, this symbol very differently, right? Uh, not A means that there is not a proof of A. Right. Um, now, the reason that this is um, important, uh, we'll see, uh, has to do with how they deal with double negation and then a very specific example, uh, which I'll show you in a second. Unfortunately, for some reason, this is not, PowerPoint's not interpreting my symbol here. Um, if you're logical nuts, it's the double turn style. Um, the idea here is that um, not not A in classical logic entails A. 
right? Um, but in the intuitionist version, if you don't have a proof that there's not a proof of A, this does not entail that you do, in fact, have a proof of A, right? All right. So yeah, if this is, uh, if, if you guys don't like this, it's okay. Um, not, much, not much hinges on this. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more what I mean uh, in just a second. But if you guys really want um, um, some examples of um, what I'm thinking about in terms of uh, intuitionism versus Platonism, uh, take the number E. Uh, e is a constant approximately equal to 2.721828. Um, it is the unique number such that um, the function uh, for the exponential function uh, is its own derivative, right? And there are, two, there are many characterizations of this. Um, here are two of them. Uh, you, can be, you can approximate E by this limiting process, um, or you can uh, approximate it with this infinite sum, right? These aren't the only two, but uh, these are two very famous ones. Now, the, here's a question, right? Now, I think we know this because the E has been computed out to many, many, many decimal places, but um, I've given you six here, right? What is the 900 and 42nd digit of E, right? Okay, it's quite possible. I don't, I don't know. The, the, the point is, um, if you look at this from, from the point of view of the Platonist versus the Intuitionist, uh, the Platonist will say that there is this 942nd digit that's existing out there waiting to be discovered, right? Whereas the Intuitionist says, well, there's nothing we can say about the 942nd digit of E until we've actually demonstrated it, right, and constructed it, right? This is all, another reason why it's called constructivism. So again, uh, there are, you know, large books that contain, you know, all of the um, digits that we know. I think um, the last I looked, uh, something like 10 to the 11th digits have been computed uh, for this. Um, but the, the general point is that, uh, at least the way that I'd like to put it, is that for a Platonist, uh, when they uh, uncover these mathematical results, they're discovered, um, whereas, in the intuitionist case, uh, they are, um, in some sense, built, right? Uh, we've, um, we've discovered, say, a proof of this, but the truth of it comes in virtue of the proof that we've made, not in any sort of revelatory we've experience we've had about the nature of the world, right? Now, um, here is a common intuitionist complaint if you um, uh, want to uh, get a sense of why it is that they have such a problem uh, with uh, some classical logic or classical mechanics. Um, this is a, uh, uh, a proof of the claim that there exist irrational numbers a and b such that a to the bth power is, uh, is irrational. Now, I, if you guys like that, that's fine. Um, but the, um, uh, the upshot of this, right, and the reason why intuitionists reject to this particular, or object to this particular argument is it relies on the law of the excluded middle, which says that uh, either A or B is the case. Well, technically it says either A or not A is the case. If you reject one of those alternatives, according to traditional logic, the other one must be the case, right? Um, and the law of the excluded middle is not valid in intuitionist logic. Um, but also, uh, there is, uh, no construction of a number that demonstrates the rationality or irrationality of the square root of two to the square root of two. Um, its rationality is uh, either assumed um, or its irrationality is assumed. So if you like that kind of stuff, great. Right. So here is um, where, let's see, how am I doing in time? Good. Um, here's where I, I want to get to the, the, the positive part of uh, the talk here. Now that we've got some sense about the relationship between Platonism and intuitionism and uh, uh, how they conceive of mathematics differently. So I've got here on the left uh, a, an image of St. Peter's Basilica in Rome or in the Vatican City in Rome. Um, and on the right, I've got here the fundamental theorem of calculus. So what is the relationship between the two of these? Um, well, let me start by talking about St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. Now, it's, it's pretty amazing if you've been there before. It's, uh, it's, it's beautiful, it's very impressive. Um, but one of the reasons that it's so impressive is what purportedly lies within. So according to um, the uh, tradition, the bones of St. Peter are buried under the crypt, right? Or in the crypt underneath this, uh, this massive altar, right? Now, St. Peter was one of the most significant apostles in uh, Jesus' life and, and ministry. And in the, uh, 
in the Gospels, we have uh, the author of uh, one of the Gospels punning on Peter's name when he has Jesus tell Peter that, Peter, you're going to be the rock on which I build my church. Right? Now, the word for rock in Greek is Petrus, and so you've got Peter and Petrus and rock and everything. Well, Peter being interred underneath the cathedral is literally then the rock upon which this central church is built. Because although there, you know, there's many, many factions in Christianity, right? This is, you know, Christianity central, at least um, from a Catholic perspective, and so you have the, um, uh, you have the, uh, the, the, the church as a whole, as it spreads all over the world, uh, resting um, both literally and figuratively on uh, on the bones of Peter, right? Now, uh, if uh, you're inclined for that kind of story then the way that you think of St. Peter's Basilica is, a, um, is something that is suffused not only with beauty and grace and, and elegance, but also uh, suffused with something about the way that the universe works, right? That this spot right here is somehow the, the point from which um, teaching, um, morality, religious belief, uh, the order and coherence of the universe emanates, right? It's sort of like you know, the axis mundi of, um, of uh, Catholicism. And it's, uh, it transforms uh, what is just a, a, an interesting exercise in religious architecture into a moment of uh, you know, deep and abiding spirituality, right? Now, on the other hand, if you don't go in for these kinds of talks and, uh, or these kinds of uh, uh, ways of thinking about things and you say to yourself, okay, so they got some bones underneath there. Who knows if they're Peter or not, right? Uh, um, you know, anybody can find some bones and say, yeah, they've been around for a long time. Um, uh, then uh, you've got a, uh, uh, you've got a, a, a beautiful uh, and incredible cathedral, um, but one that doesn't have the same kind of metaphysical and religious significance. It doesn't mean that it's worse because of that. I mean, we, people visit you know, religious sites all the time that don't uh, gel with their own religious beliefs. Um, but the, the, the kind of central significance of the religious message is uh, interpreted or understood very differently. Right? That is, um, in, a, uh, in, a, in the non-religious sense, uh, what you're focusing on is the, uh, the beauty of the craftsmanship of the, the work, the way that it attempts to embody different kinds of uh, religious themes and ideas. You study, say, the you know, motifs that are used by uh, Renaissance artists, for example, in depicting traditional religious scenes, and you know, there's a whole language for this kind of stuff that you can discuss. Um, you know, is this statue an uh, excellent representation of this or not, and, uh, and so on. I mean, so what does it have to do with, say, the, uh, the fundamental theorem of, uh, of calculus? Right? Well, this just uh, gives us a way for computing integrals. Um, the capital Fs are the antiderivatives of the uh, function uh, f of x. Um, and this is a uh, equation, a theorem in uh, uh, calculus that does a lot of the, the heavy lifting. Right? Um, this thing is uh, something that's uh, learned early on in calculus courses, but is utilized over and over and over again in many, many different contexts. Right? So, how could this possibly be, um, uh, be related? Well, I want to suggest, sort of analogically, that we think about the, um, uh, the fundamental theorem in the same way we think about Peter's bones in the Vatican. Um, that uh, uh, regardless of whether we're Platonists or uh, intuitionists, uh, this is what sort of provides the foundational uh, coherence that builds this edifice that we uh, appreciate and marvel at um, and, and so on. So uh, if you're a Platonist, of course, you're like the person who thinks that Peter really is buried underneath um, the St. Peter's Basilica. Um, and then everything that follows from the fundamental theorem of calculus, everything that we can do with the fundamental theorem of calculus is uh, a, a way of extending and interpreting the basic connection that St. Peter has to Jesus. Right? Or if you're a uh, constructivist about this, right, it doesn't mean that um, the, uh, the works of art are, are any less beautiful, uh, but rather that uh, the uh, connection you see between the fundamental theorem of calculus and the edifice that's built around it is um, a reflection of the uh, uh, ingenuity, 
the cleverness, the genius of uh, the individuals who have taken this and drawn out its logical implications, its uh, logical consequences, and uh, come up with other uh, applications and um, uses for this very basic and fundamental idea. Right, much in the, the same way that uh, Peter, as the, you know, the, the, the first pope, uh, began with the, uh, the first uh, uh, dissemination and development of the multifaceted uh, teachings we call Christianity now. All right. So that's, uh, uh, in general, how I uh, like to look at the, the relationship between uh, the two theories of the uh, nature of the reality of uh, mathematics, and now you can see why I called my my talk, the aesthetic appreciation, of math, aesthetic appreciation of mathematical objects and constructs, so as not to uh, prefer one theory over the other. Uh, but uh, before I finish, I want to address just one uh, quick possible objection that um, uh, I need to work more on to spell a little bit more fully, uh, but it's an interesting point, um, and it's one that was suggested to me by Dr. Buck a long time ago. Um, and it raises an interesting issue with respect to how we're thinking about all this. Um, when we think about things like, say, uh, you know, St. Peter's Cathedral, we naturally have this idea that we have uh, a coherent and complete uh, understanding of the universe, that somehow everything fits into place, that uh, uh, even if we don't necessarily understand what everything's for, it's all kind of you know, unified and, um, and proper. But unfortunately, it doesn't seem like mathematics is really like that, because um, in uh, um, the 20th century, uh, there were um, uh, a number of results that were published by uh, mathematicians uh, that demonstrated some very bizarre things about um, what uh, the limits of mathematics are, as it were. So um, both um, Gödel and Turing, and also I should have mentioned Alonzo Church, but we don't have to get into the, uh, the details of that. Um, these guys demonstrated that often what we think about um, mathematics um, is not quite right. Uh, to make a long story short, back in the um, early 20th century, there was a, uh, uh, a project that well, you know, we could probably take all of mathematics and just reduce it to basic logic. Right? We could show that the foundations of mathematics were based on these very simple logical principles. And there are a number of, t of attempts to do this. Um, the German uh, logician and philosopher Gottlob Frege uh, spent his whole life trying to do this until one day he was uh, getting ready to send the second volume of his work off to press, and he got this little a uh, postcard from a guy named Bertrand Russell. And on this, uh, on this postcard was a counterexample that showed Frege that his whole theory was wrong. Right? So there's your life's work, ruined by a postcard. But well, uh, Russell went on with Whitehead to publish Principia Mathematica, uh, which I don't think anybody reads. Um, but it's, a, it's an incredibly um, dense and very carefully um, argued uh, piece of work to try to show how uh, mathematics can be reduced to logic. And it takes them something like 500 or 600 pages to, in their words, prove the occasionally useful <coughs> proposition that 1 plus 1 equals 2. Now, um, this was the standard for a while until, until Gödel came along. And uh, Gödel showed that um, any uh, formal system that is sufficiently powerful to capture some of the, uh, the basic things we want to know about mathematics um, has the consequence there are statements that are true but are not provable within that particular system. Uh, what this means in, in effect is that um, we can never get completeness in terms of uh, figuring out all the lo logical consequences of our, um, of our theories. There will always be things that are um, unavailable to us. Um, and similarly, uh, Turing uh, uh, showed uh, that there are functions that are not effectively computable, right? Uh, this is what's uh, known as the halting problem. Um, and so the idea that we could somehow find a computer that could be um, uh, sufficiently well programmed so as to be able to solve any kind of uh, mathematical problem that we would feed into it, uh, Turing showed that there are, there are problems that uh, uh, can't be done um, or can't be solved in this, uh, this particular way. So um, this seems to, to leave some uh, potential holes in a, a theory that at least relies on uh, an intuitive sense of the unity and coherence of, um, um, of, the, of mathematics as an enterprise. Um, and what I want to suggest is I want to borrow a concept from Japanese aesthetics um, that, that might help in, in thinking about this. Now, the reason why 
we might be led to think about concepts of like unity and order and coherence or even perfection um, is that these are Western aesthetic concepts and you know ones that um, are certainly part of our legacy um, in terms of uh, our um, uh, our connection with the ancient Greeks um, and the revival of Greek ways of thinking, especially with respect to art in the uh, uh, the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, but if you've ever spent much time looking at uh, Japanese works of art, you find that they um, oftentimes do have a lot of the same elements of beauty, um, and coherence, and uh, grandeur in, in a certain sense. Um, but this is not necessarily all that there is to the Japanese aesthetic. And there is um, this concept of, of, of wabi-sabi uh, that uh, indicates that there is a way in which Im imperfections and flaws in objects uh, can themselves become objects of aesthetic appreciation. That something that is perfect, right, that is um, without, without blemish, is somehow in a sense, unreal, because of course, uh, from a, a, a more Buddhist perspective, this world is uh, impermanent and, and fleeting. And to try to create something that is uh, not in line with that way of looking at the world is to make something almost unnatural. And so Japanese artists um, will oftentimes deliberately um, incorporate these kinds of imperfections into their work. And the skill at doing this is uh, making these imperfections seem as if they're natural and not contrived. So uh, this is just a, a way of beginning to suggest that the uh, imperfections or incompleteness um, or loose ends that we see in a, uh, a theory very, very, very broadly construed um, might not uh, necessarily be, uh, be defects at all. All right, that's all I have for you guys. Thanks very much.